All right, hello, hello. Good morning. <laughs> well, it's eight degrees and there's a stiff wind blowing and I'm still in shorts. So we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna work inside today. Yeah. And uh, we've agreed to maybe talk a little bit about essential oils, which sort of, when I first uh, learned anything about essential oils years ago, I, I kind of just didn't get it about working with oils. And then a few years later, I realized two things, how powerful they are. So they're so compact for first aid and being quite an outdoorsman. Mm -hmm. um, like I have a little, it's a little belt pack that is sold for, uh, well, you can get things for, for like, just to put shot shells in around your belt, that sort of thing. Great. Uh, so I, I had a few little belt packs of um, things that are good for stopping bleeding and insect bites and headaches. And I had a dream one night that I was stuck on a ledge about 10,000 feet up that was only a couple of feet wide and about 10 feet the other way, or 10 feet wide and two feet deep. And um, with a couple of women that had PMS and I said the wrong thing and they booted me off the ledge. Oh. So in my emergency kit, I've always had PMS blend with me right. ever since, you know, just in case. Because like, <laughs> they say, um, if you ever, if you don't wake up, how does that work with a dream? If you die in a dream, like if you're falling, you have to wake up before you go splat or you will be dead, something like that. I don't know. Anyway, right. let's, let's not go down that tangent. But um, so the first thing I always like to get across to people working with oils early on is that they're hydrophobic, which means they're afraid, afraid, afraid of water, mm -hmm. but they're lipolytic, which means they love, love, love any sort of fat. So to dilute them, we need anything that's oily, like uh, could be olive oil, yeah. could be some butter. It's whatever you've got, uh, where anything around water, um, uh, they run away from. So uh, quite often when I'm doing classes, if there's a, something like a, a heater nearby, or even in my studio, I would have one of my photo lights up there. And, and on opening day, I take a clean piece of uh, computer paper, put a couple of drops of lavender on it, and tie it up there, mm -hmm. and big splots of lavender. And by the end of the day, there's nothing there. There's right. no stain, there's no smell, there's no anything. It's a clean piece of paper right. because they volatilize. Yeah. So we call them volatile oils, right? So where anything oily would leave an oil stain there, you'd need some sort of cleanser to get rid of the oil stain. Right. So um, when you rub oil on your skin, every most cells of your body have a sort of a fatty coating and it's called the liposome layer on something like your red blood cells, for example, there's it's three layers thick and each layer of your skin or a blood cell uh, has these little fatty layers to it. So when you rub an essential oil on your skin, it can actually go right through your skin being transmuted along cell to cell to cell right. and get right through the skin. Never mind things like hands or feet, you have pores right. and it gets in real fast but that's called liposome transmission. Mm. So anyway, the only reason I'm bringing this up is if you've ever used an essential oil on your skin and it's turning red or it's burning or something like that, or you get something in your eye, and so, you know, I've said this in so many classes, and people say, oh, I wish I would have heard that years ago. Yeah. You're, you're making, uh, this time of year, you go to the farmer's market and buy a whole bunch of peppers if you don't grow them yourself, and you're making relishes and mm -hmm. chutneys and things like that, and it's, it's a hot evening, and there's music cranked maybe, and you're chopping away, or you're using your mechanical tools and you're just you're sweating a bit and you go rub your eye yeah. and you've been working with hot air and you're whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> and even the even if you call the uh, emergency centers what do they tell you to do flush it with water that's the worst thing you can do yeah because your your eye cores your eye what's in behind the eyeball your eyeball socket the socket um <laughs> is is all mucous membrane and it absorbs very, very quickly. So uh, that's a bad idea. Yeah. And um, hydrophobic, it's going to go away from the water, which yeah. is on the outside, and drive yeah. it deeper. Yeah. And, and so what you want to do is take whatever you've got the handiest. If you're in your home kitchen, grab something that isn't sharp on the end if you're alone so you don't poke yourself, and, and dip the end of a spoon or something in whatever's handy, like olive oil, and just 
hold your head back and let a few drops of oil fall in your eye, and it's over in about 10 seconds. Yeah. You know, I've had people do things as stupid as I have at times, like take an, oh, what's this? Thinking it's some sort of fruit, and pick up a, an habanero pepper for the first time, thinking it's a plum or something, and right. bite right into it, Whoa. and then your mouth's just on fire. Yeah. So people say, oh, use some milk. Well, that was a good idea when you had whole milk from a real cow, right. and it had a lot of fat in it. Yeah. It's the fat that made the milk work. Yeah. But everybody today's got zero, zero, zero right. percent milk in their fridge, yeah. and it does nothing. You need something, Fatty. whatever's handiest. Don't use salad dressing that's already full of other stuff. Just any sort of bland, unflavored, unscented oil and drip that in your eye and it's all over. Or take a sip, if, if that's the case, if you, your butt mouth is burning, and swish it around, spit it out in the sink, yeah. and you're done. Yeah. Right? So um, the general rule when we're using oils on the outside of the body is the bigger the area, the lower the dosage should be. Hmm. If I just got stung by a wasp, I might take one drop of basil and gently rub it in, and it's going to take all the sting away. Right. Right. But if I was going to give somebody a whole back rub with Bavis basil, right. I wouldn't use it any stronger than about three to five percent. Right. Because it's a big area of skin and it's getting into your bloodstream and all that sort of thing. So the general rule is: the bigger the area, the lower the dose. Hmm. Right. And then just if something gets in your eye or um, quite often in classes, I might have everybody take a drop of peppermint and rub their gums or just sniff it really deep and it opens your sinuses and you're really awake right away. And, and I always say, now don't stick that finger up your nose or any or other orifice when you go to the washroom, okay? Because yeah. it's going to burn like crazy. Yeah. Uh, so a good idea if you like working with essential oils is always have a little vial of whatever you want, canola oil, I don't care. Just any sort of oil, sesame oil, I just, I don't care, just some yeah. oil uh, in case there's ever a, a problem. Right. right. I like that so, idea of the, you know, you said the shotgun type of belt with those yeah. type of rounds. It's almost like the perfect size of a... Yeah, and, uh, and I've had those on hikes and, and uh, going through the airport, going to meetings, going to seminars. Yeah. Uh, my favorite was actually one that was made for... Uh, there's shotguns that have... You screw the end off the barrel. They're called chokes. Okay. And um, uh, it's they're they're just a little bigger than uh, a shotgun shell. Right. Uh, and and it had a little Velcro quick closure on it and stuff. Um, but some of the ones that are meant for bullets, the ones that are meant for rifle bullets, are perfect for these little vials. Yeah. And you can get those where it'll hold about ten of them. Yeah. Because a lot of women make the mistake of throwing things like that in your purse and then you get in a bus and toss your purse on the floor right. and a bottle of peppermint oil uh, breaks <laughs> and it'll probably take the finish off the leather if it's a leather purse. Yeah. You know, there's, they're very strong solvents, some of them. Yeah. So, but... Yeah. Um, cool. Anyway. Um, those ones are uh, four and a half mils, average size yep. is 12. And then I always joke, this is like, you know, the lifetime supply. You know, That's the, 100 mils. 100 mils, but depending on what yeah. it is. Like tangerine, you know, you mentioned as a solvent, like this is amazing for cleaning. Yeah. Yeah, 100 yeah, mil might size. Use it. Lemon would be your cheapest bet for that. Right. Just regular lemon. Yeah. Um, and uh, from my understanding, the citrus oils are, they're all pressed, correct? Versus uh, distillations. Yes. And that's why... A lot of people might take... Always talk about oils. Let's, let's have a sniff of uh, tangerine while we talk about citrus. Tangerine is one of the softer of the citrus oils. Yeah. You know, it's um, in a massage blend or a diffuser blend or whatever. Um, it's very uplifting but calming, right? <laughs> we were just talking before we hit record about... <laughs> um, I have, um, I only got a couple hours sleep last night, so if I start deep breathing Roman chamomile, I'll just pass right out. Anyway, um, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because less than 5% of all the essential oils in the world 
are used in so-called aromatherapy products. Right. 95% are used in food yeah. and cleaning products. Which is so insane because, you know, like it's just general like standard, like do not consume essential oils, right? Like this is, this is the rhetoric, especially like Health Canada, like. I get this where somebody <laughs> just on a podium said, never, ever, ever swear to take essential oils internally. And then they take a break and chew a stick of gum. Right. You know, yeah. so, so the same, <laughs> farm and distillery in Yakima, Washington, where I get my peppermint oil comes from, they're, one of their biggest accounts is Wrigley's. Yeah. You know, so it's the same stuff. So if I take a couple drops of peppermint oil and because I didn't have time to brush my teeth or I had something garlicky for lunch and I have to go to a meeting now, um, or I might kiss somebody, <laughs> um, I'm going to take a drop or two of peppermint and just rub my gums yeah. and move it around. And a bit of it will go up through those, there's those two little holes in the top of your, uh, the roof of your mouth. They're called the nasopalatine canals. And if you just close your mouth, they go right up into your sinuses. Mm. And so you can just close your mouth and breathe deep and your sinuses dilate. Yeah. But you don't want to take that finger and rub your eye with no. it, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I shot myself in the face once, just this close away, head on. I just thought of this because of the unfortunate bear incidents uh, a few days ago. Um, I was unpacking from one of these uh, um, five days in the mountains with a, a group of women where we're picking and gathering and making things, set up a field lab and all that. And um, um, the safety clip, my former wife didn't understand that you don't have to, there's a little um, zip tie on the, the orange safety clip on the trigger, mm -hmm. you don't have to take that off. You, you can leave it there. It keeps, you, 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 slide the, you can slide that safety clip off and then it won't fall on the floor. So you don't want to take that little um, zip tie thing off, leave it on. But um, from taking the, the belt on and off and on and off and on and off hiking, uh, somehow that clip got lost and, and that um, fanny pack was in a box and I threw another box on top of that box and the clip was gone. So right about 10 inches away, I did a full on face shot. Wow. The inside of my, um, um, what do we call the lid on a, um, the, oh, like your cap kind of thing or, um, no, come on. Every car's got a, what I'm just missing a word here. The, the back window lifting up. Oh. What do we call that? Uh, uh oh, I'm blanking too. <laughs> okay, it doesn't matter. Everybody knows yeah. what we're talking about. But um, there was a, the impression of my head with this big orange spot there. Oh, like the wow. next day I had to clean it. So yeah. fortunately, I mean, I hit the, the, the asphalt just sort of rolling around. Um, I wasn't screaming probably, but may, maybe I should have been. And it just so happened that uh, somebody walking by with their dog, it was actually my ex wife. Um, who lived a couple blocks away, and she was walking by with her dog, and she said, honey, what have you done? I said, I just blast, go get the olive oil or whatever you see first. Yeah. And I just laid there on the pavement, and she just put her thumb over it and just poured olive oil into my eye or all over my face, really. Yeah. And, uh, and you, you use that for a while, and then go in the house and get out some soap and water and clean the oil off your face. Right. But the first thing to do is just get oil in there. Yeah. Something burning your mouth or whatever, a couple of drops is good. So anyway, enough on that topic. Mm -hmm. But um, so it's, um, we're getting to that time of year where cold and flu season, it's called. Right. Yeah. It was, yeah. We've been in cold and flu season for a couple of years now with all of the viruses going around. Um, we won't go onto that topic too heavy because we could spend a whole day talking about that. But um, there's a number of different ways that essential oils can help respiratory blends. And uh, I forgot about this just minutes ago. The two things that most impressed me about essential oils as a burgeoning herbalist was how quickly, how effectively, and how inexpensively they treat the respiratory right. whole system. Yeah. So years later, once I knew what I was doing and actually seeing clients, uh, I had people that had been fighting with COPD, asthma, all sorts of different things for years. 
and nothing was really totally working. Pneumonias, um, stuff that was like antibiotic resistant strains and that sort of thing. Yeah. And we get them cleared up in a couple of days for 20 bucks. You know, uh -huh. they, like respiratory problems are great. Yeah. And um, what about somebody who's like needs an inhaler because of uh, allergies like cats or something like that? Restricts the, the airways. Okay, two different things. And it took me a while. Sometimes from reading, I, I learn things are good for something or other, that it might take me a while to understand why. Right. Sometimes, or as my knowledge has grown over the years, uh, I base a lot on, on the chemistry. Um, if I look at the list of components of an essential oil, I know what it's going to smell like before I ever get it to my nose. Yeah. Right? So... Um, the most common uh, functional group, we'll call it, that's in virtually all essential oils are simple terpenes. Mm -hmm. So there's these things, and more people are talking about terpenes these days because of the marijuana oils. Right. Uh, so um, very common in nature are these little five packs of carbons called isoprene units. If two of those hold hands, you've got 10 carbons now, it's called a monoterpene. If three of them hold hands, it's 15 carbons, it's called a sesquiterpene. And if four of them hold hands, it's called a diterpene. And then you get into triterpenes and quatraterpenes. But once you're into triterpenes, we're talking hormones. Right. And once you get into quatraterpenes, uh, we're talking steroids. Mm. And those are just too fat to fly. Right. So they're in the herb. Right. And that's why we have to be careful about reading any sort of herbal book and thinking, oh, then I can use that uh, with my oils. Right. Not necessarily. Yeah. So yeah. if you make something like tincture yeah. from a herb, um, certain components of the herb are alcohol soluble yeah. that will come out that won't necessarily come out with water. Right. So some things come out, we're enjoying some tea, certain things come out just with hot water as a solvent, and then you can reduce that, make a water-based reduction or you can make tinctures which are usually either alcohol uh, or glycerin mm -hmm. for babies and pregnant women and alcoholics so they can still use the herbs. But glycerin tinctures aren't quite as strong and they don't last as long. Right. Where the alcohol-based ones are more complete with the extraction and they're good for years. Anyway, um, so we've got these simple hydrocarbons. Yeah. And what, is, what do you think hydrocarbons? Um, solvents. Well, what's turpentine? Turpentine is an essential oil. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a, a, a monoterpene. And when you take some turpentine, take a couple drops, rub it in your hands, close your eyes, and sniff it really deep, it's probably going to make you cough because anybody has a certain amount of mucus in their airways. It, it does a good job for you as long as it's good mucus is crystal clear and very thin and runny. Mm -hmm. So when you, in your throat, when you breathe in a solvent, it starts mounting and sliding towards the lung and nerves go off that say, we don't want that. Right. So it makes you cough. Right. That's what's called an expectorant, ah. right? So if you live on bread and cheese sandwiches, a high mucus sort of diet, yeah. uh, with, wash it down with a glass of milk, um, uh, you've got more mucus than you ever want, and it doesn't move fast enough anymore. There's these little, oh, good that I'm going into this. It's not a segue, actually. I'm on target. <laughs> um, there's all these little cells lining your airways, uh, right from your throat to the bottom of your lungs, and they're little ciliated cells with, they look like somebody with a punk hairdo. Um, is punk even a related word anymore? But where they've got all these little hairs on the top called cilia. So um, I could have brought photos of this. So lining your airways, there's all of these tiny little hairs that with each breath go. And along with a little bit of mucus to make them sticky, they catch up pollen and dust and anything else that's flying around in the air. And with each movement of, of your lung, and the mucus with all that funk in it moves at about one to three centimeters an hour, and it gets up to your throat, up to around your epiglottis, and occasionally you go, <clears throat> and you clear your throat and either spit it out or swallow it. 
Right. Hockey players spit it out on the ice. Uh, you might use a hanky. It, you might swallow it, and that's okay because if there's bacteria, which there probably is, in that mucus, your stomach acids will kill it. Yeah. So nice, healthy lungs, everything clear. And if you smell something like turpentine, which is medicinal, I, I always, when I see these signs that say 100% medicinal grade, I'm sorry, turpentine from Home Depot can be used medicinally. Yeah. Um, yeah. The pine oil that we sell in shops is distilled at a lower temperature. There are different types of pine trees. They smell nicer. But in a pinch, if you really had to do it, I've done it. Yeah. You know, you're, you're at somebody's farm in a blizzard and somebody's got a pneumonia yeah. and it's really bad and their symptoms are growing. Go to the barn and get some turpentine and come in, pour it in a, a pot of boiled water and let them sit there with a towel over their head and cough. Have a hanky nearby because they're going to cough up chunks of stuff. Right. So when you see white things in mucus, that's an infection. Mm -hmm. That's just like pus coming out of a cut. And if it's yellow in your mucus, that means your infection's going up and you're fighting. It's heat. It's yellow, right. like a flame. And if you see green and brown colored stuff, you have mucus that's been there a long time. Right. That's funk. Yeah, and yeah. That's, that's what's called catarrh. Right. And I, I laughed one night. I was getting my, my papers ready to do a conference in San Francisco. And I just wanted to make sure I was spelling it correctly. So I looked it up in my Mosby's Medical Dictionary. And it said, obsolete. And I started laughing. I like things that make you laugh out loud when you're by yourself. Yeah, you know, yeah. That's a good joke, right? <laughs> that, that you're by yourself and you're laughing out loud. Yeah. Um, so it said obsolete. And I thought, well, it may be obsolete in the English commonly used words, but it sure isn't obsolete in the American people because, right. well, Canadian, I, I would say American, the whole continent, yeah. um, um, is so common. And excess mucus that's become catarrh doesn't move anymore. It's stuck there. Right. And if you're a nice, clean lung person and there's something going around the office, you breathe in a virus or some bacteria, it comes up one to three centimeters an hour. <clears throat> you clear your throat and swallow it. Stomach acids kill it. That's how we're supposed to work. Yeah. But when you get a buildup of mucus, it sticks in there and just, it loves. Bacteria and viruses love warm, sticky mucus. And is it like, wow, this is the promised land. Right. And they love that one of the places where the, the airways continue, uh, if you take a, I don't have anything, like a piece of chalk, and, and go from your ear to the corner of your mouth, that's about where you've got a tube going to your inner ear. Right. So there's, you know, that's about where it is. And um, when you get to the inner ear, it's sealed there. Hmm. So as a home for any bacteria or viruses, that's a bit like living in Lethbridge right. or the Crow's Nest Pass. Yeah. But when they, they like to crawl up into the inner ear because yeah. it's calm there. Right. Yeah, so they yeah. can really set up shop and that's how we get ear infections. Right. More yeah. from the inside than the outside. They can get in from the outside mm. as well. Yeah. But you've got that eardrum there that seals the inner from the outer, right? It's that one treatment of, you know, like the garlic, mullein, you know, ear oil. That's going to clear up the outside. Yeah. But it's good to, to use, we could use that same oil. If you're using essential oils, you want to dilute them. You never, ever, ever put pure essential oils in your ear, especially with a Q-tip. Mm -hmm. Okay. But you can take them diluted and rub when you do little pitter patters that helps stimulate all these little valves that are in your lymphatic tubes and and just clogs in general make little make it with kids make it a game honey can you feel the fairies dancing just yeah. come up with some sort of story little pitter patters little swirling motions working from the ear down towards the mouth yeah. and that's going to help break up that mucus and get it back to a place where you can spit it out or swallow it, right? So um, that's the terpenes. But in varying degrees, a lot of the essential oils have organic alcohols in them, mm -hmm. which will kill bacteria. That's how many strains of Staphylococcus are flying around the room right now? As many as 20, like there's that many. So we get bacteria in there. 
mm. uh, maybe some viruses. And the more that you have morbid mucus, the more that they can set up shop right. and start spreading, right? And even part of the problem with even orally admitted uh, or even, uh, sorry, uh, intrave intravenously admitted antibiotics don't have a way of getting out of the bloodstream into the mucus in, the, in right. those passages. They just don't. Yeah. And that's why we get a lot of chronic infections where infect um, antibiotics orally or intravenously just don't work. Yeah. Because they don't get into the right tubes, right? Where going like this or any infection that you get in your throat. Um, I had a cousin years ago that had worked her way as far as you can, starting as an RN up the nursing chain into administration uh, that she was at the top of the, the line and ended up with some spare time and decided to go through about 10 years worth of tonsillectomy history and discovered, I think her bottom line was that about 3% of them were probably required. Right. The rest of them were just handy. No way. You know, and, and that's kind of how we work with stuff. Yeah. Know, it's, this is a quick procedure. Hysterectomies, all sorts of things are done because it's just the easiest, fastest way to get this person back on their feet. So anyway, uh, because the bad stuff came into your body by air, right. when I take a couple drops of oil on my hands, uh, what have I got here that I might just want to use right now? There's a, I've got a Japanese mint here. Um, or oh, there's clear sailing. Well, clear sailing. Clear sailing's okay. I, clear sailing is something I actually made for hangovers. Really? Yeah. So I, I did bring a few blends. Uh, it's it's for, for food poisoning and yeah, talk about hangovers and stuff. First first week I made that was Stampede Week. Oh yeah. So <laughs> when I go like this, you only need a drop or two anymore. You're just going to waste it. Close your eyes. And when you're gonna, if something's going to make you cough, don't put your hands over your whole face because you might just cough something that's in your throat into your eye sockets. Right. So go over your nose and breathe deep. As you exhale through your, through your mouth, it's going to warm everything up and make the stuff fly even better. Yeah. So after a couple of breaks, go back and forth in through your nose, out through your mouth. And if I pass something like eucalyptus around a room and nobody coughs, I say, wow, this is unusual. Good for you guys. You've got nice clear lungs. Because especially this time of year, half the crowd will be coughing. And depending on which eucalyptus I used, I might say, now that's the light stuff. You guys that were coughing right away, just wait a minute. I'm going to give you something stronger. But that's making you cough up that morbid mucus into a hanky, or <clears throat> you can just swallow it. Yeah. Stomach acids will usually take care of the, the, bad, the bad stuff. But alcohols, these organic alcohols, linalool is one of the most common ones in lavender and tea tree and other common oils, and they're going to kill the bacteria for you. Yeah. So terpenes make stuff start to slide. The nerves tell you to cough. Right. Alcohols kill the bad stuff. Um, there's another group called oxides, uh, which are really high in eucalyptus that are um, expectorants as well that make you cough. And, um, and then we go from, if something's not responding and you have a really bad infection, maybe a pneumonia, we step up from alcohols into chemicals called phenols, mm -hmm. which we have to be more careful with. They'll burn your skin. Right. You've got to really low dose those, so you might have a blend with 100 drops of other stuff and just two drops of of red thyme or oregano are good examples of those. So they really up the fighting capacity. Yeah. But uh, you want to get your airways clear and clean. And then they're working right. So nice clear. If you blow your nose and it's just a bunch of clear stuff in your hanky, you're doing things right. Yeah. You see white stuff, you know you're fighting an infection. If it's yellow, you got a, a worse infection. And if it's green or brown or something, it's old news. Right. It's been there for two months. Yeah and uh, you really needed to get it out of your body. So um, there's no point using something too strong all the time. Like a lot of people do that with oregano. They take it every day. Yeah. That's one of the oils, like red thyme as well, that I call big guns. Yeah. And those are, using those too often is a bit like hunting pheasant with a bazooka. 
you know, and you hit the bird, and there's an eight foot <laughs> hole in the ground, and there's feathers everywhere, and there's not much left for supper. Yeah. Right. So leave the big guns in the closet until you really need them. Yeah. There's lighter oils that you could be breathing and, and using them like that every day that should prevent most infections. Yeah. You know, even lavender. So actually, like that. I remember you saying this was years and years ago, uh, and you can kind of clarify here. Was you know, cinnamon is one of those ones that's like a big gun, but yes. yet is still, and I, I think it was, you know, it won't kill your, your microbiome, right? It's not, like it's antibiotic, but not so strong, it's gonna kill Thank your probiotics. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, and, uh, yes, cinnamon, cinnamon has a group of compounds called phenylpropanes, mm. and um, what do you got there? Is that just cleanse and restore? Or is that, all, is that cinnamon? That's cinnamon. Oh, that's pure cinnamon? Yeah. I said cleanse and restore because there's a lot of cinnamon in cleanse and restore. Okay. Yeah. No, that's just a pure straight up cinnamon. So cinnamon remains, to my knowledge, still after all of these years since Marco Polo was carrying it on camels, risking his life crossing the desert, uh, risking pirates and de sandstorms and everything else. Um, that's back to the days when things like black pepper would be sold in England by the each. Right. You didn't buy a bag at Safeway that you would buy them each. We were for supper last night with Markham and his good wife, and we each got a peppercorn. Oh, right. No. How <laughs> extravagant, right? You know, it was like that, right? Yeah. So cinnamon, to my knowledge, is the most broad-spectrum antibiotic in the world. Right. Literally. Hmm. Penicillin. Any of them, yeah. cinnamon stronger. Wow. But on the, if it's pure cinnamon bark oil, it's really hard on the skin. Right. So you have to be very careful about diluting it. Uh, for a full body and for a chest massage, I wouldn't use it stronger than one percent. Mm -hmm. So that's like one drop of cinnamon bark and a hundred drops of sesame or whatever you want to use. Right. Yeah. One percent by volume. Um, but um, as Malcolm brought up. It'll kill just about everything, but it doesn't kill friendly bacteria in your intestinal tract. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, where a side effect of a lot of conventional bacteria, antibiotics is that you wipe up all of your friendly flora, and that's why so many people end up with anything from yeast infections to other problems yeah. after a course of antibiotics, right? Yeah. So um, where's your lid? Right here. Okay, um, so in that you brought that one out. Um, you want to do cleanse and restore? Check that I out. had, um, right away when the word kind of got out that I was working quite a bit with oils, I had people coming to me because they themselves or their daughter or their mother or father, whoever, was going for, in for a hospital stay and they'd done enough reading. There's something called, the word is nosocomial infections, which means you can go into the hospital for one thing right. and end up with a whole new problem, Yeah. right? And this happens a lot, yeah. where you go in for a toenail fungus and end up with pneumonia just because there's so much stuff flying around. So I, I didn't want to use uh, just oils like tea tree and stuff that smell medicinal and stinky. Yeah. I didn't want to call it sick bay or something like that, which is negative sounding. Any any nurse, for example, who's got a few years' experience will back me up in saying the more upbeat a person's attitudes are, if you're, if you're kind of just upbeat in general and smile a lot and have a good time and chat to other patients, um, you heal faster. Yeah. If you're just, well, I, just well, I think I'm going to be here for six months. Well, that's a negative affirmation. You will be here for six months. If you just said that, I believe you, yeah. and you'll be here for six months. It's that simple. I could never quit smoking. I believe you. Yeah. Even saying I'm going to quit smoking is a negative affirmation because you're admitting that you're a smoker. Right. What you have to do is, what a silly idea. I don't smoke. Right. That's a positive affirmation if you're right. craving. Yeah, yeah. I never realized for all of my adult life until just recently that the cigarettes my father was addicted to were, um, uh, they were called Craven A. <laughs> a Canadian branded, well, because I'm craving, you want another smoke joint? Well, yeah, because I'm craving, eh? You know, um, <laughs> Canadian yeah. tobacco um, 
like how silly is that? It's it's a negative admission right on the the package, but people buy it anyway. You anyway, ever, you ever hear Yara's joke about uh, how they came up the name Canada? No. They threw a bunch of letters into a pot. And oh, people, no, like uh, C A <laughs> N A D A. That's about it. That goes that goes with weather reports. One guy talk, told me that because I had a theory that if you're a really really bad person, you'll end up getting reborn and become a weatherman in Alberta <laughs> because nobody will ever believe you, nobody will trust you. <laughs> yeah. And somebody else piped in, this was probably in a dog park circle, somebody else piped in, they just said, no, at the TV station, they just have a big round wheel with all of the possibilities there. Right. And a guy just takes a couple of darts and looks the other way and throws them at the wheel. Yeah. You know, because weather changes so quickly here, right? Yeah. But um, uh, yeah, bring, bringing a new couple camping off-road, any month of the year, what do I need to bring? A uh, bathing suit and a parka. Right. Because sometimes we can have a huge blazing fire and you've been camping for three days and you're getting a little stinky. And you can jump in a mountain stream and run back screaming to the fire right away. Cause, so you might, to be polite, have a bathing suit on. Yeah. But uh, it can snow in July, right? Yeah. I remember one year it snowed on the Stampede Parade. Right, wow. I only saw that once since I've lived here, but... Yeah. So anyway... No, since um, we're talking about that, we got some back to, rain starting to come yeah, down right now. Yep. Yeah. Um, so back to terpenes. So the oils that are highest in terpenes are all leaf oils, like eucalyptus, mm -hmm. but also the citrus fruits. Great. So like you were, you were trying to bring up, um, most essential oils are steam distilled. Right. But um, citrus oils are pressed much as the way we get fatty oils out of, say, almonds. It's a press and they're squeezed. Yeah. And so that's why um, nobody's growing oranges to make essential oil. They're making oranges to eat or make juice from. Yeah. And if you just crush whole oranges, the juice is gonna taste like crap because there's bitter stuff in the rind. Right. So some people have learned to use, you get, I have one, a little scraper, uh, where you can peel just Little, little strips of rind off. Um, I like putting it in when I make uh, uh, cranberry sauce for Christmas. Yeah. Uh, it's so sweet, uh, and I want to add a, a bit of bitter and complex flavors, so I'll use organic lemon and orange rinds, just, just a few, and it kind of balances out that sweetness, right? Yeah. So, so if you take orange oil, most of it, and take some and taste it, it certainly doesn't taste like concentrated orange juice because it isn't, Yeah. right? They peel the oranges, they don't want it in the juice, then go crush to make the juice, and uh, the rinds are there, so it's kind of a byproduct. Right. And that's why uh, I can go to, for example, for cleaning laundry, like let's say I got a cotton t-shirt on here and let's say I slipped here and got a few drops of something on my shirt uh, at home, I would just put, I've got a little bottle of lemon right beside my washing machine. I just put one drop on the stain yeah. and that's it because it's a solvent and it cleans it out. But if I dump a liter of almond oil on the same shirt, I need a bit more help and using this stuff would be too expensive. So you can go to Home Depot and there's a line of products called Zep. Right. They come in different colors and the orange one is orange because it's made with orange oil. Right. And even buying wholesale in large quantities like I do, I can't make Zep <laughs> that's cheaper than I can buy a four liter jug, jug of Zep for about $16, I think. Yeah. And, and for people like massage therapists, that's something you want to do to wash your sheets with mm -hmm. because you get oil stains that build up, you know? Anyway, so um, uh, I had made that comment earlier that 96% that of essential oils are used for cleaning products and food flavoring. Right. And I, you know, I'll bring up example like in large rooms. How many of you grew up with a garden and might have made something like dill pickles? And a lot of people put their hand up. So, when when you were making the dill pickles, you put all the I do cold pack method where I just put all the cucumbers in the jar and then I add some sugar and some salt and some vinegar and uh, the the spices and some hot peppers and some garlic and then the dill goes in. Do you weigh in milligrams how much dill seed that you add to each jar? 
should I be doing that? No, who does that? Nobody. Yeah. So are you willing to admit that each jar of pickles that you buy or that you open is just slightly different than the last one? Right. Mm, yeah. Well, when you go buy a Bix pickle at Safeways, you expect it to taste exactly like it what did last time. So they have a railway car outside full of vinegar and another one full of decent water. And they've got a swimming pool sized stainless steel tank and a lady in a white lab coat pour some dill oil with a measuring device right. so that the brine is exactly the same every time, mm -hmm. right? So um, that's almost the difference between using herbs and drugs in some cases, yeah. where the dose can vary a lot, right? Anyway, um, where was I? So terpenes are very high in leaf oils. Leaf oils are where the plants breathe. And by golly, all leaf oils help you breathe. Right. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. And all of the citrus oils are full of terpenes as well. Right. So if you have something like a stinky gymnasium or a stinky pair of running shoes or anything like that, maybe you walked through a swamp taking a shortcut back to your car camping a month ago, threw them in your trunk, and the whole trunk stinks when you open it now, take those, put some anything, a face towel or whatever, sprinkle... Uh, an oil blend on there, put it into the shoes and bag them so that none of it evaporates, so that the oils just circulate throughout the shoes. Right. And then, especially if it's a dark colored car, when you open your trunk next time, it'll smell clean and fresh. Yeah. You know, because the, the oils are, some of it leaked, but the shoes are virtually dry cleaned. Wow. Yeah. So, anyway, back to colds. So, we got for a simple, there's something going around, just do a quick airstrike. And that's why I use the term airstrike, because you got in, you didn't get it from peeing somewhere. You didn't get it from sitting on a dirty toilet. You didn't get it from licking a dirty spoon. You got something in your lungs because you breathed it in. So let's make the medicine that will help breathe in so that it's a direct airstrike yeah. on those critters, right? So I call this doing an airstrike. So for depending on how bad your symptoms are, I might use eucalyptus radiata or an identical cousin is called Smithii. When you see a Latin name with two eyes, that's how you pronounce it, E-I. E -I. So if I was Andrusecii, that would be two eyes after my name. Right. Um, and radiata has alcohols and oxides and terpenes. It's pretty light, so it's not going to make you cough too badly. But eucalyptus globulus has some ketones in it, so they're going to go after that heavy green funk. Right. So it's just depending on your symptoms, you can step up the ladder as to which oil you would choose, right. rather than use a big gun all the time. Yeah. And so I've met people at conferences when I'm at these international events, people from countries like France and, and Australia where they work with oils a lot, it's a big part of their economy even, they just think the way that we use in... North America, the way we use oregano here, some people that use it every day, yeah. we're just, I'm gonna use the word stupid. Yeah. Uh, because it's like the little boy who cried wolf. Right. And we've now developed strains of tea tree resistant staphylococcus, for example, because of overusing tea tree. Hmm. There's lots to choose from. And when you look at these gas chromatograms and there's all these little peaks of each little ingredient that's in a tincture or an oil, uh, Typically, we look at the big peaks. Those are the things we really want. But there's all those, we've talked about this, all those little people too. Yeah. Um, if anything, I'd, I'd like to take even tea tree, for example, from four different fields and blend it together because although it's, it's all tea tree, there might be just a couple different little guys in there and it's kind of yeah. like David Goliath. Right. You know, little David had that slingshot and he brought down that one-eyed monster, man. Yeah. So sometimes with... You got tonsillitis. Itis means infection. Mm -hmm. Tonsils are tonsils. Tonsillitis. Uh, cutting them out is a tonsillectomy. There's all those words that we yeah. stick with. So uh, when we get ketones involved, you're going to cough more. Out come the green and brown chunks. So we only do that if required because ketones at high doses are quite nerve toxic. Mm. Um, some of them would even be a 
for things that would be available in oils, high ketones would do nerve damage, even brain damage, if they were overused. Right. All right? So we've got phenols and ketones are the two big guns, as I like to call them. So you leave those in the cupboard somewhere until you need a big gun, I guess we made that point. So if you don't like the smell of um, tea tree and eucalyptus and things like that, you can make a citrus blend and so that's, that's as effective. So you're, right? you're talking so about this one here, the cleanse, cleanse and restore. Cleanse and restore, yeah. yeah. So going into the hospital, I wanted to make something that was gonna be a good broad spectrum mm. antibiotic, antiviral even, but smell nice. Yeah. So like more than 80% of that blend is just orange. Yeah, I was right? gonna say citrus, so, cinnamon, those yeah. are the two And notes. then the cinnamons in there, cinnamon and similar to cinnamon are, there's different types of cinnamon, uh, as well as bay leaves have right. a lot of the same chemistry. And there's two kinds of bay leaves um, with I mean, people. They, they don't have a smell, bay leaves. Do oh they? yeah. They do. Hey? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Unless they're really dry if they've been in a right. bag in your cupboard for 10 years. <laughs> but um, no, bay leaves have quite a, quite a bit of uh, uh, odor. And there's two plants that are completely unrelated. The leaves look the same. Yeah. Um, French, the, the, the bay leaf of French cooking is called Loris nobilis, right. and it's or bay laurel, right. and um, um, that is an extremely effective antiviral. Mm. So that's one that I want to have around um, if I know I'm dealing with. Like I had people. Uh, maybe it's not even the person that's. Oh, now I'm seg segueing again. Somebody comes to see me. Cause I had people when SARS broke out. I had a lot of flight attendants coming to me for help, and they don't want to be stinky. Right. I go, well, if you use a eucalyptus type oil, I put a few drops on that little scarf that you wear, it's part of your uniform, yeah. uh, between flights, so you're gonna smell like you had a cough drop, who's gonna care, right? right? And it's just gonna waft and kind of protect you. Uh, when you can, if, if you can, do an airstrike, that's really strong, um, and um, we can do some of those oils in very small doses, one to three drops orally as well. Yeah. If you already have an inflamed sore throat, I wouldn't be taking full strength oils orally because it's going to irritate it. Yeah. But if you think you're getting a sore throat, uh, I might take a couple of drops diluted, meaning in some oil. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so, um, I made that for to cleanse the air as well as restore your upbeat attitude. That's why I called it cleanse and restore. Right, nice. And it was interesting, my, my first wife was going in for some oral surgery and uh, the first thing we did was sanitize the room. We, we used a bunch of that, I had a spray and yeah. sometimes if you don't have a spray but you've got oils, um, I used to, something that, that speakers, public speakers call anchoring the room. Right. You wanna get there a little early to get your if you've got props or your paperwork or your computer or whatever to set up and you just want to anchor the room, you look at it empty so you feel good in the room, imagine it full of people. Um, I, I would just go up and down three aisles with something like Plans and Restore, putting drops in the carpet. Yeah. No equipment at all, who needs a diffuser? Yeah. Just do that and the whole room when people walk in, Mm, yeah, uplifting. feels like a nice, safe place to be. People smile and go, well, "What a, what a, what a nice room to be in." They, yeah. they feel safe somehow, right? You know? And they are, right? Because everybody's going to be coughing a little bit. I've got, um, I've been trying to remember to use one of my blends every time I go to meals these days. Because I've got an older gentleman on one side of me; he's in his late nineties, and he's coughing a lot. Mm -hmm. And the guy on the other side of him, he's blowing his nose a lot. Right. And this, and the other guy, the third guy, coughs <laughs> a bit too. Yeah. And I just, when you're eating, you know, you can't yeah. have the oils like right in your face. So I use them right before I go to the, uh, the dining room just for protection. Yeah, yeah. You know? um, yeah. So it can be medicinal smelling or it can be like cleanse and restore. Yeah. There's just so many options available. Um, and uh, most of those blends, the leaf oils aren't expensive. Things like eucalyptus and whatnot aren't. Yeah. When we get into 
back to the fruits, um, something like um, bergamot is actually grown for the rind, where oranges are grown for the fruit, to, to right. eat them and stuff. Yeah. Bergamot's grown for the rind. That's, that's what's put in to, when they turn green tea into black tea, it's fermented. Yeah, yeah. Uh, bergamot rind is one of the things that goes into that God. ferment. For the Earl Grey. Uh, and that's what Earl Grey is. Yeah. yeah. And um, so it's a little pricier, but not prohibitive. Mm -hmm. And then like you had the tangerine out, it's, um, it's a little softer. The, the price is going to be a little, a little higher because it's not quite as common. Yeah. But uh, it's useful in a lot of... Um, uh, Skincare blends, like especially for oily skin, yeah. acne-prone skin, that sort of thing. Tangerines used. It's a, it's softer. What's what's kind of a more unique uh, citrus oil that you've come across? Like, have you come across like a mandarin orange or? Well, we use mandarin is, depending on what country, and mandarin and tangerine are the same thing. Oh, interesting. Yeah, same Latin names. Okay. And they'll vary a lot. Right. Um, Tangelo. <laughs> um, blood orange is one that's right. usually a little more expensive because it's, yeah. uh, again, a smaller crop. Right. And blood orange is one of my favorite things. I was introduced to it from an Italian shop that not far from my house, and I got hooked on it. And it's a short season around Easter. Right. Um, but um, some of the blood oranges I buy at local um, superstore type stores. Um, are grown in California, and they don't have the flavor the Italian stuff does. When you open them, they're still kidney colored. Right. It's colored, right? And it's got a bit of the flavor. Uh -huh. But the stuff from the European crops are, are they, they taste like candy, you know? They're just, yeah. they're just such a thrilling flavor, and I, I love them a lot. But um, here, I'll, I'll buy what I can get. But yeah, speaking of citrus, I really love uh, the flowers of citrus, which is called Neroli, right? So there's a place on the map, you can look it up, it's sort of middle and a bit that way of the country, called Neroli. And um, the Duke of Neroli had this beautiful daughter who sat in her room all the time. She was so, she had like worse than seasonal affective disorder. She was just down all the time. Yeah. And um, in the spring when the orange groves uh, were in bloom. Um, she would come out dressed to the nines, fancy dresses and her hair all done, shining long, long curly hair, and twirl and dance and sing in the orchards. And her father looking down from his, his, uh, uh, his den kind of thought, if there was just some way to capture that scent for my daughter, she might have a life. So he put it on the court, on the court alchemist, given some incentive, like have this by next Tuesday or your scrotum will be hanging on, <laughs> on pikes in the town square. Yeah. So um, in 1725, for the first time, he distilled uh, orange blossoms, mm -hmm. actually from the bitter orange trees. Uh, and, um, and that's why it's sometimes uh, mostly known, the oil is known as Naroli, because that's where it started, Right. was in that piece of tract of land called Naroli. Yeah, so we just finished talking about, you know, and, and most people can relate the difference between the fruits of citrus, like a lime and a lemon and an orange and all the different variations of orange from through to blood orange. Uh, we talked about uh, the rind, where the essential oil comes from. How about the flower? Like, do you get that much difference of chemistry like between flowers or are they all kind of like a citrus flower is a citrus they, flower? They come up very rarely. I, right. I haven't run into something like, same with hydrosols. Key lime flower, you know? I haven't run into um, um, I think I think it was something like tangerine once that somebody had at one of the conferences and it okay. was just lovely. Yeah. Uh, we have, as you have done, we have the, it's not native, it's an introduced uh, shrub that grows here. You can, you can buy it for your yard or the few city parks have it. That, that's, it's not native, but uh, um, it's called mock oranges, mock orange usually. Right. It doesn't yeah. grow little oranges, but the flowers 
smelled exactly pretty much like orange blossoms do. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's one that's really nice for stress, anxiety, mm -hmm. uh, things like big hormone switches in women, like going through menopause. You're getting a little wingy. Yeah. Um, breathing the neroli. Uh, it's just so heady. Uh, if we take the top three perfume oils, being jasmine, rose, and neroli, um, and then things get more common, like ylang ylang and other oils that are cheaper and more available, uh, I would put jasmine first, personally, mm -hmm. and then rose, and then neroli last, but they're all beautiful, and I sometimes even use them together. Yeah. Um, I have a jasmine mix where I've got two different kinds of jasmine, and just a whisper of ginger to warm it up a little bit. Mm. So I called it jasmine delight. Right. And I would, when I started working with oils more, I was still in, in a sales job and um, would sometimes get in traffic jams. And uh, so I'm going to be late for a meeting now uh, that I've been trying to get for two months with this shop owner to introduce her to a new line of hair colors because I was in the beauty business for, for many years. And uh, I'm not going to make it. And this is before I would have had a cell phone. And uh, so I'm going to get all anxious. I've never been a honk the horn, give people the finger and all of that kind of guy. <laughs> but what am I going to do? I'm going to sit there. My blood pressure might go up a bit or I'm grinding my teeth. Yeah. Or I learned to, if I reach into my vial, into my little console and pull out a little 4.5 mil of Jasmine Delight and I sniff it. Yeah. Now I'm, I'm just remembering this and I'm smiling. <laughs> yeah. I'm like Pavlov's dog. Um, just sniffing it, I would have a little sniff and just kind of go, hey, if I ever get out of this traffic jam, <laughs> I'm going to go find another one, you know, and it's just, it's, there's a high to it. Yeah. And there is because it's making big changes in neurochemistry. Right. You know? Yeah. Um, cool. ser never mind serotonin levels, some of the bigger ones. You just It's instant smile in a jar. Yeah. So um, that's why I always say the biggest, best drugs in the world don't come in a can or a box. You have to make them yourself. Right. And um, some of the different hormones and um, like I'm thinking about some of the oils stimulate your pineal gland. Um, to produce uh, MDNA, which is most commonly known today as ecstasy. Right. So you can get a good high on with some of this stuff. Yeah. Um, I had, um, I remember one party I was having and one of my uh, students' boyfriends was there and found it quite, a, he was like, he noticed a bottle of uh, uh, sassafras. Right, yeah. Or, pure, or saffron, it just, pure, pure, and he just, <laughs> you can you can still get this because years ago because b before the crazy drug problem started I could buy that stuff by the liter yeah. uh, to make horse liniment with right. it was that cheap because mm -hmm. it's a really good pain reliever but after it started getting misused yeah. now I would have to go through some major red tape with the uh, never mind the uh, uh, health protection branch with the the D the yeah D E A. Yeah, I'd have, I'd have to go through channels there right. to buy that stuff anymore. Yeah, you know, crazy. You know, other than small bites. So, so some of it, um, we got way off topic there. But um, um, well, back to jasmine. So when they make, because you talked about uh, Earl Grey tea, the infusion of um, citrus bergamot, bergamot into there. Uh, what about a jasmine green tea? Is that an infusion of the jasmine flowers into the I would think tea? so, yeah. 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 Yeah, you're right. Right, and that's quite common. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's an amazing one, for sure. I don't think it smells like jasmine, but it's got a nice, delicate taste to it. Yeah. Oh, it's got some... Got Does nice it have the aroma? aroma. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Cool. Well, uh, one last question we had uh, came up. So somebody had asked, like, Plain, who did you sell your company to? Oh, um, and I noticed on this uh, latest batch of bottles, so we've been carrying Blaine's oils at Light Cellar for, for years. 
probably more than a decade now, I would say, for sure. Yeah, I'd go with that. And, uh, yeah, she's changed the name. Blaine the Herb Man is now on the label. Do you know that? Well, that, that front label was always there. That's my old logo. Yeah, but if you look closer, you know, we can compare. So an older oh. bottle says Blaine and Druzik. Oh. This, this one says Blaine the Herbman. Oh, I see. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, I didn't realize what you were pointing out there. Yeah. So um, a woman named Anita Cole, who I met as a student years ago, she took one of my courses. Mm -hmm. And um, um, she was a yoga, no, a massage therapist and started using oils and started buying them from me. Yeah. Right away. And then she got into hot yoga. Right. And she ended up getting involved with the guy that I think she married. And they opened one of the first hot yoga studios here, I think. And then they moved to Kamloops and opened the first one in town. Right. And uh, they've moved around a few times. And um, she's moved to Kelowna now. And so um, all of my product that would have been just, it was stupid how my home, like as a home business, it got to the point where some days, like a week or two before a conference, you'd have trouble finding a flat enough spot to put a bowl of soup on. Oh, I It was just, you know, <laughs> it was just, just everywhere. <laughs> there was no place to sit down. Yeah. We'd go out on the back deck in the summertime. <clears throat> but, um, uh, see, there you go. Clean my throat. Yeah. Um, so, um, her company is called Yoga Potion. Right. And you can access my oils either by going through their website, go to Yoga Potion, and it'll steer you into a list of all my oils. Or you can just, I think you can just punch my name in. Um, you can just do blaineandrusic.com, and it'll take you to the oils. But they're going to get shipped from Kelowna. Right. So I have absolutely no inventory anymore. Yeah, yeah. Of anything. Yeah. Um, which, which is sort of hard on me, you know, even... Being in the in the home right now, <clears throat> one of the ladies, uh, you had a uh, headache blend here. Right. Um, a lot of people, just intuitively, if they're getting a headache, have learned just they sort of rub their temples a little bit, and it, it helps. Or they might rub the back of their neck. Somebody say, hey, Karen, you're getting a headache. Just try rubbing the back of your neck here. That usually works for me. Yeah, right along the airline there. Well, in both cases you're doing acupressure on your gallbladder meridian. Right. So a lot of headaches, regular headaches and migraines, especially migraines for people, are actually, you're eating something that you have trouble digesting. Right. And it sets up this little war. So when we call it ascending heat in the gallbladder meridian, that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with your gallbladder. It's just that in Chinese medicine, that's, it's part of digestion. And <clears throat> so almost, I always like to say it's a little bit like if you put a hamster on a round table, it'll kind of crawl over to one edge and look over and go, oh, there's the end of the world. And then it, it'll come back over this way and look over, oh, it's, it's the end of the world. And it'll go back and forth around looking for some place that it's not getting off the table because it's the end of the world everywhere. So when something, that ascending heat comes up the gallbladder meridian and uh, it comes up, there's two points and I'm just forgetting my, uh, so it's GB, I think it's GB 14 and GB 20. Um, I forget which is which, though. <clears throat> right on, on the, right on your hairline, uh, on each side of your neck, about three inches apart. They're four inches apart. Mm -hmm. That's where your gallbladder, and then it comes right across the top of your head, and stops about. Just want to find my eye here. About right here, I think that's GB twenty. That's the end of the tracks. So this ascending heat comes up and it hits the end of the track and starts going and that's what gives you the headache. Mm. So when you do anything, like just rub it, yeah. that helps. Right. But a, for a single oil, my two favorites would be peppermint or basil. Yeah. Uh, to just, you can take, most people I can in small, just a small little portion, an inch somewhere, use oils full strength, which, which is what we call neat, meaning pure. Yeah. It's like ordering a scotch, neat, or scotch on the rocks. <clears throat> so neat means pure. So, so you're going to keep well away from your eye and just gently massage it into your, 
your temples. I had one of the staff come in the other night and said, Blaine, you got anything here for a headache? And I, I just took a drop. I don't have headache land in my room, but I had some peppermint oil. And I, I just rubbed her temples briefly, and then without taking any more oil, did the back of her neck. And she came back about 15 minutes later and just said, wow, it's gone. Yeah. You know, it works that quick. Nice. So the oils work quite well. So what's in that blend is, from memory, uh, definitely peppermint and basil and lavender. Uh, that might be it. And then it's cut to, um, just to make sure it's going to be fine on the skin, I think it's cut to about 35%. So it's still quite high concentration, but yeah. not neat. Right. And um, that, some of my blends, that one, I whipped up at four in the morning for a girlfriend that had a really bad screaming headache. Right. And it worked so well that I've never changed it. That was like 20 years ago. And I've probably sold, I don't know how many thousands of bottles I've sold of that over the years. Yeah. Because uh, it works and it's cheap. Yeah, you know? totally. Although the ingredients are all cheap. and Purse, pocket, yeah, carry around. Yeah. yeah. Uh, easy to carry. And um, just remembering that those little vials, you, you don't want to drop them on the floor because they crack pretty easy. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's better to have them in a, really in a Ziploc or something. I mean, if you, or one of those bullet things I was talking about, or just any sort of little something furry pocket, little a thing you could store dimes in or whatever, yeah. um, just so they're somewhat protected. Um, and um, um, what I suggest to people always is immediately, if you get headaches regularly, start a diary. Every time you get a headache, write down everything you've eaten or drinking, drunk, drank, drank, any, anything you drank or eaten mm -hmm. for in the last even 24 hours, but especially your last meal, right? last 12 hours, let's say, Yeah. Uh, and keep a diary. And you might see yourself a pattern there. Right. Or if you won't, um, I probably would, but a naturopath would for sure. Yeah, yeah. And, and then what you want to do is completely eliminate that food yeah. for a couple of weeks and then pound it. Right. Like, let's say it's apples. Yeah. So if you realize it's apples, then drink apple juice and eat apples and have some applesauce and just eat all the apples you can. And, it, and within a few hours, you just got a pounder. Well, then you hit it. It's apples. So you just get off apples. Yeah. There's a list I have uh, we call the dirty dozen. Right. And it's the 12 foods that are most likely to cause triggers. Right. Um, onions are on that list. Um, um, dairy product might be on that list. I, I just don't remember for sure. But yeah. some of them are just, they're otherwise good, healthy foods. Mm -hmm. They're just something you don't digest well. Can be a trigger. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. yeah. So um, look for that trigger because uh, if you find it out, then you don't need anything because you'll never have a headache again. For you sure. Avoid that food. Always address the root cause, but you know, help deal with those symptoms. Hey, and and peppermint's good. good for so many things that you could just have peppermint too. Yeah. You know, fresh breath and yeah. other things. Just keep it, fingers out of your eyes. And yeah, uh, I use it as a breath freshener all the time. Or uh, keep my shoes smelling okay. I'll, um, uh, what I might do is just for the tingle is if my sandals are getting stinky, I might put about four or five drops on my foot and um, rub my foot before I put them in the sandals or the other way around. Right. Um, for stinky shoes, as I mentioned earlier, you'll get the best bang for your buck by putting something in there and bagging them right. so that it floats around. I had um, uh, a few cases of really bad nail bed infections. And um, these are the most common in people who wear uniforms, whether that's a drywaller or a framer for, for male, usually male jobs, or somebody like a, a waitress, which could be a guy as well. But you have a, uh, everybody wears the same black skirt with a white blouse and black boots or something in your restaurant. Yeah. Um, and uh, so you're wearing those same shoes a lot, and your feet get a little sweaty, um, especially between the toes. And uh, that's where we get athlete's foot, right, because it's moisture there. So again, um, what do we want to use? Well, 
plants don't make all of these little treasures for us. They make them for themselves. Yeah. So where does lemongrass come from? Um, tropical jungles where lemongrass is like a giant lawn. Uh, I've grown it, and you know, and it'll get about 12 feet high. Yeah. Indoors, it hit the ceiling, no and way. then started growing this way, and from here to here, it flowered. Wow. It was flowering right on top of the table. But uh, in the jungle, it'll grow up to about 12 feet high, and its feet are in, its ankles are in this warm tropical mud full of fungus. Right. So where does the oil come from? Mostly the ankles of the lemongrass is right. where they, what they distill. Yeah, yeah. So it's good for lemongrass feet, so it's good for our feet. So uh, for something like athlete's foot, because back to the hydrophobic story, if you use pure, uh, I like to use lemongrass and tea tree, because mm -hmm. uh, it's an antifungal as well. And if you use them together, it, it just smells better. But you, you don't want to use it full strength, because if you get sweaty, it's going to burn. Right. Um, so um, anyway, back to where I wanted to go with that story is, um, so I had this one waitress that came and saw me, and she had really bad, like her toenails almost looked like tortoise, she tortoise, tortoise shells. Um, and we had her all cleared up while she was on vacation. And she came back to work, and within a couple of weeks, uh, the toenail infection was back. Hmm. And it hit me, we didn't treat her shoes. Oh. And the fungus was living in her shoes. Right. And that's what got me onto this uh, for workers, construction workers, etc. Yeah. Take it could even just be an old sock and sprinkle the oils on and stuff that in, but bag them so that the oils don't escape. Bag them overnight. Yeah. Treat the treat the shoes. Yeah. Hmm. So the appearance of a nail has the appearance like as you described a tortoise shell. Like, does that indicate that would that be an indication to you of of, of an infection or? Well, nail bed infections, the, there's a whole science to... Uh, yeah, reading the nail. Yeah, reading nails. Yeah. Uh, like the little, that inner moon is relative to protein, and that little bit of a dark line next to it is relative to liver. Yeah. Uh, lines this way are B vitamin deficiency, I think. I think it's when they go this way. Those are all little signs. You can take a whole weekend course on yeah. reading nails. Yeah, it's cool. And that's, that's back to Chinese medicine. Yeah. Um, if there's ridges going, you know, horizontally or, or vertically, or yep, yeah, and like um, white spots. I know it's zinc. Just it's just like iridology or tongue analysis or whatever. There's all these, yeah, and, and one that came along late and um, uh, late enough in my career that I didn't take a course in it. Just respect that it works uh, is sclerology, right. where all of the little blood vessels in the yeah. whites of your eyes, yeah, you know, uh, mean something uh, specific. Like if you've been standing in a windstorm all day, you're going to get bloodshot eyes. But I mean, generally in a nice, healthy environment, yeah. you've got blood vessels in there that are going certain directions and where they point yeah. or if they fork. And that, that's all yeah, the whole science a, just in, yeah, in uh, eye diagnosis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so um, um, anyway, so I made the point about oil safety, I think, well enough. And um, the more... You don't need, if you like rosemary, you don't need to know anything about the chemistry. You just like, you, you just like eating rosemary with fatty dishes. Yeah. It might come in handy to know that if you like it in cheese sauces and with lobster and especially lamb and things like that, it's because what rosemary does in the food, or when you take a few drops orally, is it stimulates your liver to produce more bile, which is what emulsifies the fats. It's right. kind of like your dishwashing detergent. Yeah. So it's, it's a natural food to combine, mm -hmm. or oil to combine. So you can learn more about the chemistry. And um, some plant families, like the worst, I'm sure, is um, uh, labiate. Uh, which labia, like a set of lips, mm -hmm. uh, the, the flowers all look a bit that way. Um, so that's the mint family. Right. That's got lavender and rosemary and mint and sage and a whole bunch of common kitchen herbs yeah. in it. And depending on where they're growing, 
the chemistry can change drastically. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the first story that I heard was a, uh, a German, I think, uh, medical doctor who had gotten some red thyme, which is thymus vulgaris, and it busted a bad pneumonia just in three days. And he was so impressed, he immediately ordered more from the same supplier. Yeah. And he got this stuff that wasn't reddish brown. It was clear, and it smelled kind of light and sweet, but it still said um, Thymus vulgaris on it. And uh, he called the supplier and said, there must be an error here. And, and the supplier checked their books and said, no, that's Thymus vulgaris. So it, it created this mystery. It, the plants to look at are identical. Mm -hmm but their oils are drastically different. Hmm. So when I was in, in Provence briefly, um, and there were times when you'd have people that have acres of lavender or clary sage out there, and they've got this big still. Some of the biggest small operation stills would be about as round as that table is. Yeah. And then in the bottom so that the, it's almost like different ways of per perking coffee because you don't want to burn it. Right. So they'd have this big cast iron looking like the spokes of a wheel <clears throat> with holes drilled in it so that the steam was coming out kind of evenly. Yeah. And then they pack it carefully, right. uh, trying to be uh, looser on the bottom and you can pack a little heavier towards the top. Yeah. So as the heat, the steam goes through, it's a little more evenly heating the leaves, right? Yeah. Well, you're doing some distilling now. Um, so um, the pack is very important, but um, um, where did I segue there? Um, time. Vulgaris. Yeah, so um, it's the first one where they started looking at time and I was staying overnight with this fairly small operation, a few acres out there of, of the lavender and clary sage, but then they had a smaller still just for things. So the wife and a couple of her girlfriends uh, would get up early, early in the morning to climb that mountain over there. Uh, to get up high before the heat came in the sun, and then they would pick their way down, picking Great. the same plant, and they would end up with a, a muslin bag full of the same plant, it's still Thymus vulgaris, and when they distilled it in the small still, uh, they might get, like in a still that might be no bigger than a garbage can, uh, they might get 100 mils of what we call Thymus vulgaris, and they, they shortened as an abbreviation on a label, they started the expression chemotype, it's thymus vulgaris, but what chemistry is it apt to have? Right, okay. So uh, red thyme uh, is, is CT, um, uh, I'm just thinking uh, with the red stuff, it's ketones, uh, it doesn't matter. Um, uh, oh, no, it's red thyme is very similar to oregano, so it's uh, carvacrol and thymol. So red thyme is CT thymol, because right. it's got a lot of thymol and just a little bit of linalol. Linalol is the alcohol in lavender. Right. Where the same plant way up there is lots of, living, lots of linalol mm. and this much red, red uh, the thymol. Right. So it's a completely different chemistry even though they're the same plant. Amazing. So with things like especially thyme, but basil, rosemary from different countries, you can buy the same, uh, if you have been using the same sage, let's say, from one, one supplier and try it from another supplier and it smells completely different. It's not bad, it's from a different environment. Yeah. Different altitude, different country, different region, hmm. different soil. So that's what started the practice of chemotyping. And as I was saying just before we got started today, um, that's so deep that every, you might have the same plant in your front yard and it's gonna have different chemistry than one two blocks away. Yeah. Never mind two miles away or 200 miles away or in another country. Yeah. Uh, and when we use herbs generally, it's a real hit and miss. Like we don't know. I'm sort of right. condemning hermalism here in a way. <laughs> we don't know exactly what we're getting. Right. And that's one of the arguments against uh, drugs where they are one thing for sure, for sure. Right. Because they're all balanced and tuned. Yeah. But some of the oils are done that way as well, where if it's got a chemotype on the label, we know that you're getting a certain percentage of thymol. Right. So red thyme and oregano are almost identical, but 
oregano's got a lot of carvacrol and a little bit of thymol, and thyme has a lot of thymol and a little bit of carvacrol. Right. So they're equally effective. I was somehow drawn to red thyme for some reason more than oregano. Yeah. It was just one of those gut feelings or something. So I use a lot of red thyme, and we use those big guns for one of two things, a really bad infection yeah. or just straight heat. Mm. You, you want real deep penetration. If I take something even like birch or wintergreen, rub it by itself on a sore knee, that's liquid aspirin. So it's, it's 99% lin, um, linalol, uh, methyl salicylate. Right. So um, literally liquid aspirin. But if I put a little bit of thyme or oregano with it, it's going to penetrate just a little more. Right. So hmm. that's what we end up with some of these muscle relief blends and things like that is. Yeah. Yeah. Doing a bit of a mix. Cool. Like this one here, uh, strains and sprains. Strains and sprains. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. There it is. Yeah. And you can, you can smell the. Yeah. The first thing hitting your nose is that wintergreen smell. Right? Yeah. It's probably birch. Yeah. That's nice. And um, sometimes it's interesting that mostly with vegetables and things, we want stuff as fresh as can be. But something that's curious is there's compounds in, when oils are first distilled, that are just downright stinky. Right. Um, and I hadn't heard of this uh, before quite some years ago. Um, Ray Dunphy had run, she, she was buying her lavender from a cooperative in Provence, which I have now visited. And wow, you walk into these warehouses and there's containers, <laughs> you know, it's a big warehouse and there's containers of lavender from different fields. Yeah. Some of them are blends. Some of them are people that are used to getting a particular lavender from a certain grower. So they're all labeled from which farm and that sort of thing. Um, and there's some of the containers are about the size of your kitchen, holy, you know, and that because they distribute all over the world, right? Yeah. And um, they'd run on a lavender, so Ray was out of lavender, and you just can't be out of lavender. That's your biggest seller, peppermint and lavender. Yeah. And um, she had these at back orders and cranky customers filling up, so they kept saying, "But it's not ready, Ray. It's not ready, Ray." And she ship it anyway. So she got this lavender that just absolutely stunk, and. Um, um, I had picked up a bag of supplies from her. That's back to when I was buying a big amount for me was a hundred mil. Right. You know, where now I buy five gallon pails. Yeah. Um, and um, I phoned her immediately and said, "Ray, whatever. I'm going to use the word shit here." Or there's there's a nice polite <laughs> word. It's a Ukrainian word. We were talking about this in the car. I think. Um, if you're not sure if you can swear in front of an audience, you might. Can I swear in front of an audience? There's certain words. Like, George Carlin did that seven words you can't use on television. I'm not going to use them here. Um, I remember them. I can just rattle them off, but I'm not going to do that. But um, uh, a lot of people may say, oh, shit, it, it's sort of accepted. But if that upsets anybody, there's, it's quite a pretty word, really. Himnya. 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 Isn't that just, it rolls off the tongue nicely? Himnya. Big pile of himnya. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, so... Um, this lavender smelt burnt or smoky or something. Yeah. It was just bad. I, and I said, whatever that shit is, don't sell, ship anymore. You're going to get complaints like crazy. So she's on the phone again back to her supplier. And they said, well, we told you it wasn't ready. Just open the pails, put some cloth over it to keep the bugs out, and let it sit for a week or two. Hmm. Yeah. It just had to breathe. Right. And I had the same experience with lavender uh, peppermint that I was buying from uh, there was two two brothers that have a distillery um, just outside of Lethbridge okay. and um, uh, they were growing peppermint and gosh it was bad um, I, I I bought a they didn't have anything to ship it to me in because they're used to selling drums right and so one of them just went to um, Canadian Tire and got a gas can for me. No way. And I was surprised that um, one of the kids was coming up to Calgary for the weekend and, and uh, I got five gallons of peppermint in a five gallon gas can right. on, on a bus. I was surprised they even let him on the bus with a gas can. Yeah. But uh, anyway, and um, 
Uh, the next morning, when I came downstairs, I stopped halfway and almost threw up. Mm. It was that stinky. Really? And then it clicked in this experience with the lavender with Ray. Yeah. And that's what I did is I put a, did J cloth still exist? Kitchen, little towel, kitchen, right. little cloths. Yeah. Uh, I put a piece of J towel over it with a couple of rubber bands just to keep the flies out. Yeah. Left it in the garage for a week. And it was beautiful. Wow. So there's certain things that when you just distill, so keep right. that in mind with what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. There's certain things that actually need to breathe for a while. Right. Interesting. And then we keep the lid on tight. Yeah, yeah. You know? Hmm. Very cool. Yeah. yeah. So um, I, I, we went to that. Um, birch and wintergreen are chemically identical. Right. And typically about the same price. They're fairly inexpensive oils. So if you have a recipe somewhere, and this is where it's nice to get to know your Latin names and your chemistry a little bit and stuff. Uh, what if the place you usually get wintergreen from is out and then the only thing you can buy is birch? That's fine, just yeah. even same dosage, same everything. It's 100% identical. Um, and um, uh, some of these other oils, like back to the thyme, you know that for certain blends you need red thyme, not thyme linalol. Right. Um, I had uh, a woman calling me one day, uh, kind of frantic. She was looking for thyme linalol. She had an 11 year old with an ear infection and she had a, a, an aromatherapy book uh, written by a French physician and um, um, she couldn't find any thyme linalol. She'd called a couple of stores and everybody said, well, if you can't find any, call Blaine. Yeah. So she finally got Blaine on the phone and said, are you the Blaine? Yeah. And I said, yes, I am. And she said, well, I can, do you have time linalol? And, and, I, and I said, well, I do, as a matter of fact. Uh, but uh, can, I, can I ask what you, what you need it for? And she said, well, I'm making a blend for my daughter's ear infections. And, and I said, well, she said, I've got this book here from a French doctor. And I said, what's, what's his name? And she said, uh, uh, Jean Belnet. I said, oh, I know Jean Belnet. I had supper with him one night. And she was just astounded. Right. And, and I said, I'll tell you, have you got some uh, rosewood? And she said, yes. And I said, have you got some red thyme by chance? And she said, yeah, I do. Yeah, just a little bottle. I said, that's fine. So take 100 mils of rosewood and put 10 mils of red thyme in there, and you just make thyme linalol. Right. Interesting. And she said, why are you doing this? And I said, to save you $85 in a trip across town. Right. Yeah. And, and she said, but, 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 and I said, no, Jean would approve. Yeah. And she was so impressed that I'd actually met the guy who wrote right. the book. And, oh, cool. You know, but it's, it's like that sometimes where you can, yeah. you know, whip things up mm -hmm. when you know your chemistry. Yeah. Well, there we are. That's what you get after uh, decades in the uh, in the industry it is decades I think with oils it's about 35 years yeah amazing and yet I still can I continue to say that's how much I know yeah like yeah. I was just telling you I've been doing some research for uh, Anita Cole yoga potion back to that yeah in Kelowna and um, a few things will have gone up in price because she's shipping differently than I did and to be honest, I had so many things that should have gone. I was so overdue at raising prices. Yeah. At first with my blends, which is where it started, I, I was just making blends for my own clients. Um, and then they wanted to buy some, or their friends did. So I started making more blends. And then people wanted to say, well, can we get your lavender? We want your lavender. And I said, no, no, I just get... I just buy lavender, go get it from her. No, 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 we want your lavender. So pretty soon I was doing singles and, yeah. and it just, the list grew and grew and grew. But um, I never wanted to be doing that. It was never some passion I had. Right. That it just sort of almost got forced on me. Right. You know, and it turned into a career. And yeah. if I look at where it all started with living in the bush alone, uh, that's... This year, that'll be exactly 50 years ago. Right. That, that trip alone in the woods. Wow. I got a birthday coming up soon, and yeah. it'll be 50 years, because well, I, I was 18. But that uh, was before I had any education. The, the book will you know? do out soon, hey? And um, 
Well, I, I have, yeah, I have an autobiography that I did, and I have to figure out how to publish it or do a book on, what do they call them, audio books or something? Or, right. I, I still would like to have a book. Yeah. Um, but uh, we'll see where that goes. Yeah. I've got to find the money and whatever. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it's when I came back from that that I realized I wanted to know more about first aid by definition. Right is what to do until the doctor comes. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to learn more about second aid. Right. How to do things like set a dislocated shoulder and how to, what if, what if, what if. I, I've been so lucky, Malcolm. I remember one, one day I was just ending a day of deer hunting after work and it was starting to get dim. So I was heading back to the truck and um, I had moccasins with no crepe soles. Yeah. And I was just going down about a five foot little hill and lost my footing and under the snow, the snow was about three feet deep, there was a, a, an old dead tree with branches sticking out and a branch went right through one of my thighs Oof. and my jeans like right through, pierced right through my leg wow. and I was pinned there on that leg like I had to be really careful yeah. about lifting myself off that wow. and looking at a chart that would have missed one of my brachial femoral arteries right. by about an inch, Jeez. or I'd be, I would have died that day. I would have bled out on a tree trunk. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. So it, like literally, I would have died within minutes. Wow, yeah. You know, no help available, I'm alone in the forest. And so I wanted to know more about how the body worked Yeah. and learn more about the plants. Because mm -hmm. I thought I'd be doing, I don't know, that, that trip was my longest ever. It was four and a half months. Yeah. Um, but since then, and all that I've learned, I've gone out on canoe trips for, say, a long weekend, taken a few condiments, maybe, like a little cooking oil or something, but um, basically gone out with no food for a long weekend and yeah. done well. Yeah, you know? awesome. So, um, how many times have I almost drowned? I got between a bear and her cubs. Right. I definitely had repeat frostbite, which, well, there's, there's a topic. If you ever, in this crazy town of ours where the weather changes quickly, because this has come up, um, and the, here's a story from back to my friend Ray Dunphy, who we lost a few years ago uh, with one of her daughters. Um, you've gone to school or work dressed a certain way, and the temperature drops like crazy, right? Yeah. And you're coming home uh, inadequately dressed and you get so your ears frostbitten or your toes frostbitten um, you're gonna have to be really 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 careful for the whole rest of the winter right because you have done vascular damage right and uh, what happened with one of her daughters was uh, her and one of her friends were at a party they were sliding doors onto the back deck and they went out uh, for a smoke and uh, one of the boys thought it'd be cute to lock them out for a while, and it was 21 below. Jeez. And her girlfriend got cold toes. Yeah. But her daughter almost lost her foot. Wow. Because she just had frostbite last week. Oh. And it just, like, it'll hit you. So yeah. if you ever get your, your ears nipped or something, yeah. I don't care if you have to call a cab or whatever you have to do, plead for a ride, borrow some cl extra clothing. Yeah. You can't be re-exposed. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. Within short time afterwards, hmm. so and and in Calgary, that's very important to know. Yeah. Cool. Well, it's been a great, uh, great morning. Good chat. We about done. Yeah, for sure. We're about okay. uh, ninety minutes in. So, yeah. Well, there's a few oil-related topics, and again, I could talk about oils for a whole weekend without running out of breath. Yeah, sort yeah. of. Well, maybe I'd run out of breath, but <laughs> I wouldn't run out of stories. For sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we'll be back again next week. We hope that you'll join us. And uh, as always, you know, give it a like, post any comments. Send and, questions in. Yeah, send questions in. And uh, we're happy to add that to the list of our conversation here. So until next time, bye for now. Again, thank you. Thank you.